Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown! And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. One Sunday morning, a pastor got up to give his Sunday sermon, and it was particularly short, just about 10 minutes, which was at least half the length of his usual sermon time. He explained the reason after he finished why he gave such a short sermon. He said, I regret to inform you that my dog, who is very fond of eating paper, ate that portion of my sermon. So I was unable to deliver that part of my sermon this morning, which made it somewhat shorter than usual. After the service, a visitor from out of town who happened to be worshiping with him that day went to the preacher and shook his hand and said, Reverend, thank you so much for having me today. I have a very special request to ask of you. If that dog of yours has any puppies, I would love to have one so I could give it to my pastor back home. I don't like to start with corny jokes, but today I did. It is woefully true that many of us are far more concerned with the length of a sermon than the content of a sermon. I had a prior church member tell me one time, many times actually, that every single thing that happens on a Sunday morning should be decided by the clock, particularly that clock right up there. You know, I can't believe we didn't take that down when we replanted. Uh, It's so old and you can hear it ticking. I'm sure Alexandra loves it. Um, But uh, a lot of folks believe the service should be decided by the clock. For whatever reason, once 12 o'clock hits, that's when the Holy Spirit leaves. You know, he checks out right at 12. Nothing good can happen after 12 o'clock. Um, and listen, I've preached too long before. Not a surprise to any of you, right? I have preached too long. I try not to make that a habit, but it happens. Uh, I understand that there is a threshold of acceptable length given the text and the audience and what's happening on a Sunday morning and all of those things considered, and I have breached that threshold more than once. I'll tell you, it's ironic because when I uh, began to experience a call to ministry, a desire to uh, pastor or to preach, one of the things that held me back, I thought there's no way I could find stuff to talk about for 45 minutes. My goodness, you know, my, my fear was that my sermons would be too short. Uh, and that is not my concern today. Um, Our text today, though, in Jonah, shows us that short sermons aren't necessarily a bad thing. Jonah preaches to that great city of Nineveh in chapter 3, and it is arguably the shortest sermon in the Bible. Of course, we we also see in chapter 4, though, that maybe his heart and motivation were not in the right place Either, but regardless, the Lord used the world's shortest sermon to save an entire city from judgment. I mean, the king preached a longer sermon than Jonah did in this passage. 
It's a compelling passage for all preachers and teachers of the word, those who aspire to ministry, but it's also significant for all of us who are serious about fulfilling the Great Commission. God's chosen mode for getting His truth into people's hearts is proclamation. God's chosen mode for getting His truth into people's hearts is proclamation. All of us, men and women, young and old, are called to proclaim Christ. And the wonderful freedom that the Lord gives us in this text is the reminder that His Word does the work. The role of the prophet is not to come up with some fancy lecture or adorn a fancy revelation of his own, but to simply tell the people what God has said. Other preachers have said it this way, the preacher is just a waiter. He's not a cook. His job is just to get the food from the kitchen to the table without messing it up, right? I told that to the inmates last week, and they ate it up. And that's what we do on Sunday mornings. I don't have anything to give you. I didn't cook anything this week. This is God's word that we deliver to God's people. This is what faithful preaching looks like. And the text today shows us at least three fruits of faithful preaching that we'll go through together in a few moments. But the first point I want to look at to kind of remind us what the book is all about and catch us up is uh, preaching in the presence of God in the first three verses. Preaching in the presence of God. So first see the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So it's a little deja vu, doesn't it? A little deja vu. This is how it all began. Chapter 1 started just like this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah to go to Nineveh. And the only difference between this first call and the second call is that final phrasing. This time the Lord says, With the message that I tell you, the first call ended with, for their evil has come up before me. This reminds us, though, how it all began, where it all began, which was with the presence of the Lord. God's presence was in and with and near Jonah, so that his word came directly to him. God's presence was also in Nineveh, so that he smelled the vile evil that had come up before him, what was taking place in that City. The Lord knew what was going on in both places simultaneously because the Lord is everywhere. His presence is unescapable. Jonah tried to flee from his presence. Twice it's mentioned, away from the presence of the Lord, away from the presence of the Lord. He fled. How did that go? What did the Lord do? The Lord hurled. The Lord hurled. The Lord hurled. The Lord hurled. Jonah found himself at the bottom of the ocean, swallowed by a fish, only to learn that no one can outrun the Lord. After repenting and praying in the belly of the fish, the Lord sovereignly commanded the fish to spit Jonah out on the dry land, and he survived. And immediately, without delay, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Arise! Only this time he says, with the message that I tell you. The Lord's making it clear that His will triumphs. His will is supreme. Nineveh, still full of evil. Nothing's changed in Nineveh, but something has changed with Jonah. Jonah has learned that his will is no match for the will of the Almighty. You go with the message that I give you. It's worth noting here that God didn't change the plan. Jonah had to get on board with the plan. You know, I've found after being a Christian for about 16 years now, the Lord usually gets it right the first time. Uh, the Lord knows what He's doing, right? We're so quick to question the Lord's will and His plans and purposes, why He allows certain things to come about in our lives, or why He doesn't allow certain things to come about in our lives. And it's certainly difficult sometimes to discern the hidden will of the Lord concerning the personal events that we go through. but Sometimes we make it more difficult than it needs to be just because we don't like what he's telling us, right? Um, but how happier we would be if we trusted him the first time around. Jonah wouldn't be all wet and covered in fish juice if he trusted the Lord the first time around. And so we ought to as well. And I don't know what you're questioning in your life, but the Lord is not questioning it. He has plan A. And plan A is the only plan, right? There's no other plan. 
And I assure you that plan A really is the best, both for you and for God's glory. But another part of this is also to recognize that the word came a second time. You know, the Lord didn't give up on Jonah, even though he didn't listen to him the first time. So if you've neglected the will of the Lord, or if you've run for him from him for some time, God is compassionate and gracious and loves to use broken rebels for his glory. I know that because the church is full of them. Don't think that the Lord is done with you because of your past. We saw two people get married yesterday that had a story to tell, didn't they? We heard their testimony, and the Lord got all the glory from it. Praise the Lord that His will doesn't change, and He keeps giving us opportunities to serve even when we once ran away. I also want to make it clear that this is God's Word that was about to be put on display. God's Word is the shining trophy of chapter 3. There's a reference to the Lord's Word three times in these first three verses. The Word of the Lord came to Jonah with the message that I tell you, and then Jonah went according to the Word of the Lord. The Word of the Lord is guiding chapter 3. It's all about God's Word. Jonah didn't even want to go to Nineveh. Jonah had nothing to give to the people. God's word is what compelled him to go. The Lord had a word for Nineveh. God's presence was in Jonah. God's presence was in Nineveh. God was preparing Jonah's heart to preach. God was preparing Nineveh to receive the word. And what a wonder it is to proclaim the truth of God to dead hearts. The Lord seamlessly bridges the gap between the preacher and the hearer, miraculously and masterfully implanting the word into the heart of the sinner. This is why preaching is the primary focus of what we do on Sunday mornings. Because we believe what's happening, even right now, is miraculous. The Lord bridges the gap between my voice, the words of this text, your ears and your hearts. Right? That is miraculous. And that's what He's doing in Nineveh. The wisdom of the Lord is awesome. So Jonah arises, he goes to Nineveh, which the text tells us was so great a city, it was about three days' journey in breadth. Now historically, scholars will tell you it wouldn't take a full three days just to walk through the city, even though it was huge, but it would take a full three days to visit each neighborhood, essentially, in the city. Uh, so for him to fully explore, preach, and rebuke the city for its wickedness, for him to go through all of it would take at least three days. Um, but this place was exceedingly great. Um, the Seelies could tell you about the Great Wall of China. Have you ever been there? I've never been there. Pretty cool, I imagine. They had a Great Wall, the Great Wall of Nineveh. The wall surrounded the border of the city. It was so large, it was like a super highway. They traveled on top of this great wall with horses and chariots to get from different districts. Nobody else was doing that. And Nineveh was old. In Genesis chapter 10, this is one of the earliest cities. Nineveh was built by Nimrod. Remember Nimrod? The mighty warrior, not a good guy, but a mighty warrior, built the city of Nineveh. And it has this reputation of being massive and historic and old and huge, the capital of Assyria. It's, most importantly, wicked, evil. Sodom and Gomorrah 2.0, right? Not a good place. So Jonah goes to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord and in the presence of the Lord, and you won't believe what happens when he gets there. First fruit of preaching is repentance. Preaching brings repentance. Verse 4. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. These two verses are extraordinary. We read them so quick, and they're so, they're so brief. But this is more than our minds could possibly comprehend what took place in these two verses. Jonah just began to go into the city. First day. Hasn't even made it into the heart of Nineveh yet. He was on the first leg of the race. 
And what was he preaching? What was the message God gave him? It's just five words in the Hebrew language. Just five words. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people said, shoo, that'll preach. All right? They said, amen. Can I get an amen? This is good preaching. Regular Billy Graham over here. Started a crusade. Five words. We don't see that, do we? I mean, this is, this is short, blunt, not exactly a sugar stick sermon. This is the message that God gave and that Jonah preached. And I think that 40 days that he begins with is significant. You guys, I know y'all read your Bible, so I don't have to tell you 40 days means something, right? You don't have to, you don't have to think about that too hard. 40 days, 40 days must mean something. Um, it's in several different places in Scripture. Most prominently, you'll remember in the book of Genesis when God poured the rain on the earth and from under the earth for 40 days and 40 nights and flooded the entire world. This was a phase of judgment as God flooded the entire earth. But for those in the ark, that 40 days was days of mercy as they were protected from the wrath of God and had to wait for many months for the waters to dissipate. This span of 40 days comes up again in several other places, but I think it's a primary reference to the judgment of God. And Nineveh was about to be judged after 40 days. And think about it. Jonah could have strolled into town saying, y'all are toast. Too late. Today is the day. Get in the ark or die, right? But no, he says 40 days. You have 40 days to repent. 40 days of warning before the judgment would even occur. Why does the Lord give them 40 days? Because grace, man. Because grace, the evil of Nineveh, had become so vile that God was roused to fierce anger in the smell of his nostrils. He had every right to judge them right then and there, but just as he persecuted Jonah for the sake of showing his grace, he now gives a 40-day grace period to the wicked Ninevites. Isn't this amazing that the Lord would give them any grace period at all? Just one day would have been plenty of grace for the kind of evil that was going on in Nineveh. But he gives them 40. I wonder how many of us give grace periods to one another. That's a thought, isn't it? Mariana signed up for this subscription service recently, and it was supposed to be one of those one-time payment things. Like, I don't want the monthly deal. I just want to, I want to buy this one time, right? And so, of course, in the fine print, Miss something, there's an additional charge. Next month, they're rolling it in. We see it taken out of our bank account. We're like, what is this? Who's taking money from us? You know? And so we go and we find out what had happened. And uh, so she gets on the phone with this company. And uh, the phrase I like to use, she puts the Matheny on them, which is, a, which is a compliment to the Matheny's, okay? I don't have any Matheny in me. She put the Matheny on them. Uh, she called, she got on the phone, and they said, well, listen, we have a three-day grace period for refunds. Anything after that, we can't refund it. So Mariana found the charge on a Thursday, emailed the company on a Friday, and then called them on Tuesday the following week. They were saying she was out of the grace period. Mariana was happy to inform them that she was well within the grace period because not full three, full three full business days had elapsed since the discovery of the charge, and she emailed the day after finding the charge. Managers were contacted. Words were shared. We got the refund. How many of us, though, are like that subscription service. We want to give people as little grace as possible. 40 days is just a little too much, don't you think, God? We're ready to write someone off the moment they look at us the wrong way. And the Lord's over here given the most wicked place on the planet 40 days. Do you give 40 days for your offender to ask forgiveness? Maybe you should give 400 days. 
There's no set time. But grace is grace. And more grace is usually not a bad thing, at least according to God's character. Right? He is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, slow to anger, but by no means would clear the guilty. This is how we are to live under his covenant with us, particularly in our relationships with lost people. What if we prayed for 40 days straight for the Lord to save a loved one or a friend? If you ever tried that, it would be a great thing to try. Who knows? God may turn and relent from his anger and open their eyes to his goodness and lead them to repentance. We must live under grace and extend grace to others. Of course, Jonah was preaching hellfire and brimstone, right? Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Five-word sermon. How do you think the people would respond? Verse 5, and the people believed God. The people believed God. And we say, like, this is crazy. you got to be kidding me, right? They had 40 days. Th their first day, they believed God. The first day. He's not even gone all the way through the city yet. Jonah is just full of surprise. I was talking to uh, Josiah about this at, at dinner Friday night. Uh, it's full of surprises, right? The Lord says, go to Nineveh. Jonah runs. Didn't see that coming, right? God warns Jonah with a sea storm. Jonah gets thrown in. Didn't see that coming. Jonah gets swallowed by a fish, prays in the belly of fish, and uh, is, survives for three days. Didn't see that coming. The word of the Lord comes a second time to go to Nineveh. The, he goes, and then they repent, right? Didn't see that coming. This is just, this is, an, um, this is a well-written book. <laughs> He preaches the shortest sermon ever to the most wicked people on the earth, and they believe in the God. They believe in God in the first day. They had forty days, repented the first day. We've we've read this story dozens of times. We should still feel the shock every single time we read verses four and five. He hadn't even made it all the way into town, and they're calling for a fast, putting on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. All of them repented and believed in God. That word for believed is important as well. It's used in the book of Genesis, same Hebrew word, where it says that Abraham believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. This is not just believing a message about God, that God's judgment was coming, but this was believing that he is God. The only God. Like Nineveh was converted, right? Nineveh was given faith in Yahweh. They didn't just escape wrath. They became, they became worshipers of God. And this would have driven the Jews mad to see this kind of thing happen. You can understand why, why Jonah didn't want to see this take place. Nahum, which uh, Jay read, is a whole book written about 50, 100 years after Jonah devoted to the judgment of Nineveh, right? And I, I thought about making him read chapter 3. Chapter 3 is just... It's, it's hard. There's some hard stuff in there for a public reading, which we could have read it. But here's a little bit of chapter 3. I will throw filth at you, speaking of Nineveh, I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt. I will make you a spectacle, and all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh! Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? This describes the spirit of the Hebrews against Nineveh, particularly the Lord. And of course, Babylon is going to come in as the, the new world empire take over Assyria after this happens, which so Nineveh would be judged. It's interesting that that, the, the, uh, but Babylon, Babylon, Babylonian rule would come in after their hearts are softened, right? So that Israel could be judged. And there's a lot more I can say about that. Well, God sovereignly chooses to save these people who were desperately wicked. We're shocked at passages like these, maybe because we don't want some people to repent, but certainly because we don't expect people to repent. I know that's true because I know my own heart. We don't expect people to repent. But beloved, this is the fruit of faithful preaching. We should expect repentance to happen every single Sunday. We should expect repentance to happen today because the word was preached. We should expect repentance to happen every time the word is opened because this is fruit of the ministry of the word. 
we should expect repentance from our friends and neighbors when we share the gospel with them. We should expect repentance from Shane and Susan's family members and friends who were at the wedding yesterday. We should expect repentance from every poor soul that remains under the wrath of God that hears the word of God. Because we want it. Spurgeon says famously, Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay and not madly to destroy themselves. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. You know that God's presence is with us when the Bible is opened? He's with us all the time, but particularly in a majestic and mighty way when His Word is at work, causing people to repent and believe even right this very moment. The Lord is preparing soil in the hearts of people in these very pews to repent as we open the Bible and proclaim it according to His Word. We preach in the presence of God. This keeps getting better. The second thing the fruit of preaching does is preaching brings reform. Preaching brings reform. Look at this. Y'all won't believe it. Verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. So before Jonah even gets through the whole city, the word makes it to the king himself, right? And king was probably like this ruler, governor type person over a province that included Nineveh. Um, however it happened, the Lord reached the, the Lord's word reached the king's throne, and um, the text says, I love this play on words, what did the king do? The king arose, right? We see the Lord's word summoning the action of Jonah in his call to go to Nineveh, and now as the word has reached even the king, the king arose. So the king didn't arise to go somewhere. He arose to take off his robe, to get off his throne. Because he's met a greater king. He's met someone whose word is above his own. Isn't that beautiful? The word of the Lord came to Jonah, and now the word of the Lord went to the king of Nineveh himself. He stoops low in ashes. And according to verse 5, the people had already started doing this without him. The people were already covering themselves in sackcloth and ashes before any mandate was made. There was a move in the hearts of the people to repent and worship Yahweh, but the king decided to make this thing official. Everybody's doing this, right? He left his throne to make room for the true king, and he orders the entire city to do the same. A public fast for both man and beast, no food, no water, and we say, this is a little extreme, right? I mean, not, not feeding the animals food and water, covering them in sackcloth and ashes as well, seems a little much. But this is what genuine repentance looks like. It holds nothing back, full bore. Involving the animals was a statement to the Lord that says, all that has breath in this city will praise the Lord. Everything's repenting. All that we have is yours. This was a way, of course, with sackcloth and ashes. We don't do that today in ancient times to show their grief or their public shame. But we know that today the Lord sees our hearts, whether we fast or mourn or pray, whatever we do, repentance must come from the heart and repentance must hold nothing back. Notice how massive this work of repentance was and how it started from the bottom up. 
The people heard the word from the least to the greatest, it says, and then they publicly repented. So many people were repenting, believing in God, that the king was made aware, and the king was pricked by his own sin, and he decided to make this thing mandatory. So it wasn't just that the people of Nineveh had turned to the Lord, but even the government had been converted. The king stepped out of the way for a greater king. It affected the moral law of the land. In verse 8, the king says, let everyone turn from his evil way, from the violence that is in his hands. This was a city that prided itself on violence and asserted their dominance over weak people and oppressed other nations. And the king now says, stop it. Stop it. We're not doing that anymore. Change your actions. Jonah didn't even say that, right? The king called the people to repent. The word of the Lord had become the new law of the land. Again, we can't wrap our minds around the revival of Nineveh. We think the great awakenings of our day have been something. I don't recall anything like this. This is amazing. And I want you to see how faithful preaching of the Word brings reform. It brings reform to homes. It brings reform to churches. It brings reform to neighborhoods, to cities, to states, to nations. And eventually God's Word will reform the entire earth. And even the heavens will be made new. Everything will be made over by the Word of God. This is kind of a hot topic these days, you know. I'm not particularly into politics. Y'all know that about me. I kind of dread it, to be honest. I've already heard chatter about the 2024 presidential election and the people that are running. I'm sure you have as well. And when I see that stuff, I'm just going to be honest with you, I roll my eyes and I don't want to deal with it. Maybe I shouldn't think that way, but that's just where I'm at. All right, just being honest with y'all. But let me say some stuff about this. I'm going to say some stuff. Christians should absolutely care about politics. We should vote. We should pray for leaders and government officials. We should pray for nations and world relations. We should pray for the military, for those at war. We should care about the poor and the oppressed. We should care about the place that we live and the laws that govern us and the flourishing of life. So the question is, if we genuinely care about all these things, what should we do? If we genuinely care about all these things, what should we do? I believe the Bible's answer to that question is to preach the Word of God. That's the Bible's answer, okay? Do you want to see your town and your community changed? Preach the Word of God. Is this where it starts? Do you want to see your church changed? Center everything on the Word of God. If you want to see your home, your marriage, your family, your children change, center everything on the Word of God. Do you want to see this entire nation changed? The United States of America Christianized. Do you want to see that? Preach the Word. Voting matters, right? Voting matters. But you know what matters like a million times more than voting? preaching the Word of God. (laughs) Right? Y'all with me? You see what I'm saying here? Look at what happened in Nineveh. This was a bottom-up kind of change. We make disciples. Disciples make more disciples. Those disciples make more disciples until disciples are in all realms of life and civilization throughout our land, which affects all realms of life and civilization throughout our land. I long for a day in which we see presidents fear the Lord and call for its citizens to fear the Lord. I want that to happen. And so I'm going to stay here a long time and preach the Bible because I want that to happen. I long for a day in which entire people groups give up evil and violence in their hands. Therefore, I pray and I preach in the presence of God. The word of the Lord is that powerful. It does this kind of work. When God's word takes root in a society, in a family, in a church, it changes everything. Everything is turned upside down. 
I think we've seen that on a small scale here in our church. We've decided to put God's word first here. And I believe the Lord is blessed. And we are beginning to harvest the fruit of a word-centered ministry. We aren't perfect, but I pray that we stick around long enough that what has happened here affects more and more churches and homes around us and ultimately our entire town, our entire county. We've got to stay for the long haul. And we've got to be committed to the word for the long haul to see this kind of change. The Lord can do it in a day if He wants, like He did in Nineveh, right? But whether it happens in a day or in like 2,000 years, it's going to happen by the preaching of the Word. Of course, though, this kind of reform really isn't possible without reconciliation. Reconciliation. How does the text end? The last two verses, 9 and 10. Preaching brings reconciliation. Who knows, the king says, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. I love the way verse 9 is phrased by the king, full of hope in anticipation of what the Lord might do, but also a sense of reverence and uh, solemn fear for the coming wrath of, the, of God. Who knows? Who knows? We can pray, we can repent, we can cry out mightily to God, but the decision belongs to the Lord. Only He knows what He will do. And what did God choose to do? God relented of the disaster that He said He would do, and He did not do it. The Lord was willing to give grace up to 40 days before the judgment would come. It should be no surprise to us, based on God's merciful revelation of Himself, that He would indeed show amazing grace to the Ninevites immediately. They did not perish. But this sort of troubles some of us a little bit, right? I know we're at the end. We can't get too deep or get a little deep, just a little deep, okay? What did I say about preaching too long? Here, here just a little bit. Did God change his mind? It seems sketchy to say that. Wait a minute. You know, and, and then we go back to Genesis when the flood came. And even before the flood, the Lord said that he regretted that he had made man. You know, we see passages like this and we're sort of troubled. Does God change his mind based on our actions? Do we dictate what God does? Does God respond to us or do we respond to Him? Who's in control here? Is, is God just following the whims of His own emotions or what the people on earth are doing? Jonah has clearly taught us that the Lord has one will and that will is supreme over man's. So when we read texts like this, we shouldn't question God's nature or His stability. When God relents, we should be led to praise and thanksgiving that God relents. Because this doesn't mean that God changed His mind or His will. This means that God has initiated peace with us. That's a better way to, to think about this. This is the heart of the gospel, right? We were dead in our sins, deserving of His wrath. We were rebels at heart, enemies with God, living at enmity with God stealing His glory for ourselves. But Jesus Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility and has made peace by the blood of His cross. We were separated from God, exposed to His fierce anger, but through the righteousness of Christ, He has made us what? At peace with God, reconciled to a holy God. We were broken, we were separated. Now a relationship has been restored. We've been reconciled to our Maker. And God will not pour out wrath on those who are counted as righteous. For Him to do so would be to contradict His very nature. God would sin against Himself to blaspheme His own holiness by pouring wrath on those who are counted as righteous. 
the Ninevites believed in God. They were counted as righteous by faith. God relented. Peace was restored with man. God is merciful and just all at the same time in examples like these. And it makes him all the more wise and glorious and praiseworthy. Did you catch the end of verse 9? The king was desperate that all the people of Nineveh would cry out mightily to God that they may not perish. Friends, because of our sin, we all rightly deserve to perish. But God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever should believe in Him might not perish, but have everlasting life. If you're here today and you've not confessed your sin before the Lord and believed in Jesus Christ for the atonement of your sin, hoping in His sacrifice alone, trusting in His resurrection that you might be made right with God, you will perish in a real place called hell forever. But the Ninevites can testify today that if you cry out to Him, He will indeed relent. They will testify at the day of judgment to all those who refuse His mercy. He is full of grace. He's full of mercy. Come to Christ that you might not perish, but have everlasting life in His name. And what urgency you and I must go. Don't be like Jonah, but do go according to the word of the Lord to reach all nations with the love of Christ because God's plan to reform the entire world is to see all the world reconciled to a holy God, every tribe, tongue, and nation. So we preach the gospel here. We send missionaries across the world. We pray for nations to be soft toward the gospel that they might hear the good news and God's kingdom might come down. Just like it did in Nineveh. We're proof of that, aren't we? We are Gentiles who were far from God, but by trusting in His one and only Son, we have not perished, but we have found everlasting life. The proclamation of this message has power. The preaching of the Word has power. Let us never stray from it until the whole world hears. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this amazing truth that we are so slow to believe. I pray the word would take root here in our church and it would continue to reform us, each and every heart and each and every home. And as our church is reformed, we would extend and reach out to the neighborhood around us and those who are lost and dead in their sins, who are not at peace with God, who are like the Ninevites, and who will one day be overthrown by the judgment of God. I pray that we would preach boldly expecting repentance, expecting reform, expecting reconciliation, because this is what your word does. And Father, I pray that uh, you would raise up more churches to preach the word, those who have drifted from the word in, in Rutherford County. I pray, Father, for more faithful pastors and uh, revitalization, and churches to be replanted, new churches to be planted. Um, we pray, Father, for our town to be Christianized. We pray, Father, for the uh, spread of disciples in government realms and all spheres of life that affect law and behavior and action and what is mandated in this place. And I pray, Father, that um, as the church stands as a bold witness, it would just affect everything. And we would be the voice of truth and reason. Uh, and that even kings here would step aside to let you rule. Father, you would rule through the kings and governors that you've set up. Uh, thank you, Father, for where we live. We ask that you would do what only you could do by the word of your truth. Your word is truth. Come and speak boldly to this people and to this town, this nation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.